Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. And I'm so honored to have Abby Hall join me today where we talk about her work in economics, which is based on militarism, as well as her book, Tyranny Comes Home, The Domestic Fate of U.S. Militarism. Abby Hall is an assistant professor in economics at the University of Tampa, Florida, and a research fellow with the Independent Institute. She earned her PhD in economics from George Mason University, and her research interests include Austrian economics, political economy and public choice, defense and peace economics, and institutions and economic development. Professor Hall's work also includes topics surrounding the US military and national defense, including domestic police militarization, arms sales, weapons as foreign aid, the cost of military mobilization, and the political economy of military technology. She is currently researching how foreign intervention adversely affects domestic, political, social, and other institutions. And this is what we pick up on in this conversation, where Abby questions whether the strategies, tactics, and approach used by the US military in their foreign policy interventions is imported back to the US and adopted by the domestic police force. Has the U.S. domestic police force become more military in its approach to solving crime or dealing with the public? And is this an actually good thing or a bad thing? Abby co-wrote this book with Chris Coyne, who also featured on the podcast in episode 101, if you'd like to go back and listen to it after this episode, which I'd highly recommend. And if you want to explore other episodes that are quite similar, Abby made reference to another economist, David Scarbeck, who also featured on the podcast in episode 55, where he spoke about the economics of prison gangs and the social order of the underworld. So why not check out these other two episodes once you've listened to Abby Hall? And you can check out all the links, books and resources mentioned by Professor Hall over at economicrockstar.com forward slash Abigail Hall. Or visit her own website, abigailorhall.com. I'd like to give a big shout out to Rosalind Tang, who is this week's patron of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Thank you so much for your recent contribution, Rosalind, and I really hope you get to enjoy this episode. To find out more about how you can be a supporter or contributor to the Economic Rockstar podcast, why not check out patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar. Or simply subscribe, rate and review on Apple Podcasts or any other platform on which you listen to the podcast. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode with Professor Abby Hall. Thanks very much for coming on and taking time out and, you know, really interested in the work that you're doing and how you find it. (laughs) Well, thank you. Uh, Thank you for having me. Is it okay to refer to you as Abby? It's just that in... Your the email and some of the conferences. Oh, that's... yeah, absolutely. Abby is totally fine. Good, good. No, I think uh, I'm ready to, to jump in if you are. I don't know in terms of like audience and like how long or technical you prefer answers to be. You do whatever you like. Okay. The audience, you know, they're I suppose they're well educated. They have a good grasp. Obviously, there's other people out there that are quite new to the discipline. Um, and I suppose like myself, we wouldn't have had the chance to be able to explore the side of economics that you're doing. So it's, you know, you, you do what you have to do. Okay. If you want to get quite technical, do that. Oh, all uh, right. There's a couple of questions that I put out to listeners and they got back to me and I'd like to pass them on to you and ask the questions on their behalf. It'd be great. You sure. Know? Absolutely. Abby, it's fantastic to actually reach out to you and see the work that people like yourself are doing. And I've had Chris Coyne on the podcast, episode 101, and he, his type of research is in the area that you're in. And it's very interesting, especially with what's going on today, whereby you have a lot of uh, the foreign policy, I suppose, seems to be quite topical. And I'd like to be able to understand how foreign policy fits into the work that you do as an economist. So my research, um, I've, I've worked with Chris actually for a long time. Uh, he was my dissertation advisor in uh, graduate school, and um, we have continued to work together. And our recent book, uh, Tyranny Comes Home, The Domestic Fate of U.S. Militarism, was just released by Stanford University Press. Uh, and in that book, we address that very question of how it is uh, that foreign policy is impacting, uh, particularly we look at civil liberties in the United States. 
if we look at how economics treats foreign policy, or if we just look at how economics looks at foreign intervention in general, the research tends to look really, really different than the type of research that my co-author and I do. In what way? So if you look at how defense, however you want to define defense, is typically modeled in economics, it's proposed that you have some benevolent and omniscient, so this all-knowing entity, which is exclusively interested in promoting what's called the public interest or some some version of the public good. And they are modeled as being these, again, benevolent social welfare maximizers. So you have this assumption that there is some mathematical social welfare function, defense or national security is part of that function. And then it's really just, it's boiled down to a math problem. If you model defense that way, and if you model any government action for that matter in this way, you eliminate the possibility of things like error. You eliminate the possibility of things like waste and special interest. And we know that that is not at all how the world actually works. And so what my co-author and I intend to do both in this book and throughout our work together is trying to point out that this is a really inappropriate way to go about modeling and discussing issues of defense. And that by looking at things in a different way, by using a different set of tools, ones that economists are particularly well suited to use, that we can really gain some important insights and understanding about a variety of different things, including the uh, ever important foreign policy. Anybody who does research in any area in economics, there tends to be a foundation or I suppose seminal studies or theories that have been built, that we, we build up on. And did, where did you find or how did you find or your kind of sources of inspiration or what kind of economists or work might have been done in the recent past that allowed you to build up on that? Or is this something that's relatively new? So we certainly see ourselves as contributing to a few different strands of literature with this new book. So one of those strands would be constitutional political economy. So looking at how it is that constraints are put in place to constrain political actors in particular. We also contribute to public choice economics. So uh, economists like James Buchanan, economists like Gordon Tullock. We also contribute to literatures outside of economics. So we see this as being something that also is of interest to historians, to political scientists, to people who are interested in military studies. As far as the people that we've built off of, those that I named, uh, absolutely. Um, our work most closely in this book is related to that of another economist. Uh, his name is Robert Higgs. He is an economic historian. And he wrote a book in, I believe, 1987, called Crisis in Leviathan, where he talks about the expansion of the scale and scope of government. And he relates that in particular to this idea of crisis, that when crises occur, whether those crises are real or perceived, you see this expansion in the growth of government, both in terms of scale and scope. And our work most closely uh, relates to the groundwork that Robert Higgs has laid. With this growth in government is, and due to a crisis, is this because of maybe the citizens may somewhat be afraid of, I don't know, making choices or fear what's going to happen and maybe trust government and allow then government to grow bigger and perhaps become more, not necessarily in any state, but become more dominant in terms of the decision making that's being made? Or is it that the governments decide that given a particular crisis that they have an input that they want to fix it and they create maybe laws that cement the power of that particular government. So there's a lot there's a lot to potentially talk about there. So um, if you'll indulge me, I'll take that in two parts. Yeah. So there are some theories in terms of who is really doing the pushing for expanded government. It depends upon who you ask. So one of the strands of literature that I didn't mention that we contribute to is a long body of literature 
from economics, political science, and elsewhere that looks at how government expands. So two of the most prominent theories is you have one which are referred to as the citizen over state theories. So that's basically an argument where citizens, by either looking for additional benefits from the government, uh, are pushing to have the government expand. This is in contrast to citizen over state theories, which in recognizing uh, some of the things that we talk about as economists, things like the economics of bureaucracy, things like public choice or the incentives that political actors face, that there is this persistent push on the side of government to perpetually expand. So that's one potential way of thinking about it. And we do address that with respect to the fear point, especially uh, that's absolutely a part of it. Higgs talks about that. So in his framework, what you have is you have some trajectory of government growth. There is some crisis that occurs. Again, whether that's a real crisis or a perceived crisis doesn't really matter for that framework, and it doesn't matter for ours either. And at that point, you see that fear is very important. So there becomes this big push from citizens for the government to do something to alleviate the crisis. And government, as it typically does, obliges that request to do something. And so they increase the scale and scope of their activities. And even when the crisis abates, we do see what Higgs refers to as retrenchment. So government does or can shrink but it never quite returns to that base level of growth that he originally describes. When we discuss fear in our book, we talk about it as being something that is underlying or something that sets the stage for our broader framework. Fear has a very powerful effect in that it makes citizens more willing to allow for trespasses against their personal liberties. To use an example from uh, the United States, the Transportation uh, Security Administration or the TSA, if you had asked someone flying in 1995 if they would have been okay with someone scanning their person and their property uh, and potentially touching them in rather intimate areas every time they fly, people would have told you that you were absolutely insane. But after 9-11 and after uh, the start of the global war on terror, people are genuinely afraid of what might happen if government is not checking people while they're flying. And so people have become very permissive of types of activities, which prior to that would have not been acceptable. That's exactly what I was thinking when um, I put a question to you and you started to discuss the fear factor and that type of thing because I recall back in, when September 11 happened, the government seemed to grow under say, George Bush uh, by implementing new laws to be able to take action and perhaps uh, do a search at airports and also to try and track uh, people or individuals' whereabouts in terms of their destinations and that. And people are citizens of America or any other country who fear that type of uh, terrorism do, would actually be willing to perhaps give up some part of their civil liberty in order to protect themselves domestically or the, the country from an attack. And I, I think that's the mindset that people have kind of acclimatized to. Uh, I know there are, that's not broadly speaking, there are groups that would prefer that not to happen in order to protect their privacy. Um, I suppose we see what's going on now with uh, Facebook at the moment. Um, there seems to be a lot of privacy that seems to be a bit, uh, like the data protection got onto a new level in terms of being able to share all that third-party information with other companies. I think people certainly do have concerns, and I'm glad you brought up this supposed trade-off between liberty and safety because you hear that a lot. And I know in the United States, it's not even still, it's not uncommon to hear things like, well, I don't care if the TSA searches my stuff because I have nothing to hide. There's this perceive, there's this perception that in order for us to gain more security, we have to give up our liberties. And that frankly is not accurate, especially if we're talking about something like 
terrorism. And, and again, I'll use the TSA as an example. It's an organization that fails 95% of its own exams. Okay. I wish that I could fail at my job 95% of the time and continue to get <laughs> budgetary increases. You have an organization that, again, just can it, it continues to grow. It has yet to catch a single terrorist the people who have tried to engage in acts of terror on airplanes were not, since 9-11 I'm talking about, were not caught by the TSA. They were caught by passengers on the plane. So you have the now infamous underwear bomber and the shoe bomber. These were people who got past TSA. And so what, what does that tell you? You're not gaining any more, you do not appear to be gaining any more security, and yet you're giving up. You're giving up your liberty. And one of the things that we are really trying to point out in this new book, especially, is that even when we're looking at policies which don't appear to be ha- have any kind of domestic focus or domestic component to them at all, you can still see very real and very nefarious domestic consequences. And what way? So what what we do in the book is we we develop what we refer to as the boomerang effect of foreign intervention. Yeah. So like we, we refer to the uh, foreign policy, and again, we focus on the U.S., but our framework is more generalizable. We look at how foreign intervention can wind up impacting domestic liberties. And so typically when we talk about or when the public or policymakers talk about foreign policy, again, they tend to do so with some pretty terrible assumptions. There's this idea that foreign policy happens in a vacuum, that it is distinct and completely separated from domestic outcomes. So you have domestic policy, that's here. You have foreign policy, that's over there, wherever there happens to be. And there's no uh, there's no crossover between them. And you wouldn't you wouldn't think there would be. You, you think that because they're applying a certain foreign policy, that there are two different policies in terms of domestic and foreign. But as you mentioned there, you're going to explain is that they're qu- quite linked and interrelated. That's absolutely right. So what we point out is that when you have a government who is operating outside of its own geographic territory, a lot of times those constraints that might be faced by, say, a constitutional democracy. So you look at the U.S. government, you look at the government in the U.K. or elsewhere, what you have are governments who might be relatively well constrained domestically, but those constraints are either weakened or maybe altogether absent when we're talking about foreign intervention. The fact that that's the case provides a testing ground of sorts for governments to engage in, to develop and hone new methods of social control. And so what we identify are several instances focused post 9-11, where those methods of social control, which have been honed or developed abroad, wind up being uh, imported back to the United States. And so we identify a few different cases. We talk specifically about domestic surveillance. We talk about the use of drones in the United States. We talk about the militarization of domestic police. And we also talk about the use of torture in U.S. prisons. And what we see in each of those cases and in others, which again are are not included in this particular book, but what we look at is how those foreign interventions have directly led to or contributed to those particular problems, which people are now identifying and talking about in the United States. So what we're trying to point out is that you can't make that clear break between foreign and domestic policy, and that even countries which are relatively well constrained can still see this erosion of their liberties by engaging in foreign intervention. That's quite worrying. I know in the book you mentioned about Mark Twain's warning in a couple of essays that he had written, almost satirical essays. But, you know, those warnings seem to be coming true in that the foreign intervention that a country like the US are undertaking, they bring the skills that they develop or the new tactics that they uh, test or even apply out there. They're bringing them home and you'll see the actual US police. I think uh, in your book you mentioned that it first started with the SWAT team. 
Uh, yeah. And so we look at, again, a few different cases, but police militarization is a, uh, a very hot topic in the United States mm-hmm. right now, particularly over the last few years. We've seen a very large discussion. This started really with uh, the uh, shooting death of Michael Brown, uh, an unarmed teenager outside of St. Louis, Missouri, in the Midwestern United States. And you saw protest, and the protests were met with police in full military gear, what's called battle dress uniform or BDUs, with high-powered weapons. And people are looking at this and saying, our cops look like soldiers. And so one of the things that that we sought to do was to understand uh, how it is that that happened. It was a topic that we'd actually looked at before, but we had not appreciated the uh, international connection. So to use the SWAT team example specifically, what you have there is a scenario where you've got uh, race riots which are taking place in the United States. So these are outside of Los Angeles in the summer of, I believe, 1965 or 1967. The date escapes me at the moment. But the LAPD or the Los Angeles Police Department felt really overwhelmed and unprepared. So you have a member of the police department named John Nelson, who was a former Marine. So he had seen combat in the Vietnam War. And he was part of what's called an elite force recon unit. So when we hear reconnaissance, we think about just just that, your your information gathering. But this was actually a very effective, highly trained killing force. So they engaged the enemy something like 95% of the time. You compare this to other Marine units where it was something I believe like in the 30-something percent. They had a much higher kill ratio, so they killed many more enemies per man lost compared to other Marine units. And so when he was observing these race riots, he used his experience to then go to his commander, uh, an inspector by the name of Daryl Gates, who would later become the police chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. And he suggested the creation of a unit which would be modeled exactly after this elite force recon unit that he had been a part of in Vietnam. This idea was accepted. It was championed by uh, Inspector Gates. And in very short order, this new SWAT team was created. Every member of the SWAT team had former military experience. They referred to it as a platoon in the department. So again, we're already seeing this linguistic link up here. And over time, what you have is this spread of these what are now called SWAT teams. So special weapons and tactics is the name that they're given now. The original proposed name, and again, I think this is clearly linking this militarization point, uh, they were proposed to be called the special weapons and attack teams, but it was thought that attack was too politically unpalatable. So yeah. that's that's one particular example Uh, And of course, this is compounded and we talk about it in the chapter that you start adding in things like the war on drugs and the war on terror in the United States. You see other policies allowing surplus military equipment to be transferred to police departments. And you get this just this scenario, which is ripe for what it is that we're seeing now. And we actually even go back even further. So if we start to look at the what we consider to be the first origins of the militarization of police in the U.S. We actually go back to the U.S. occupation of the Philippines in 1898. So where you wind up seeing the creation of the first SWAT teams, you see that uh, structural groundwork laid actually decades before. Some people, like, I, I don't know, I, I think having a SWAT team could be a good idea as long as it's dedicated to a specific task but then when it gets to the point whereby it becomes more of a police force and it's dealing with police matters and then uh, actually you confront, for example, a teenager who is just minding his own business, uh, but the, the police actually believe that he's holding a gun when he's not even holding a gun. You know, that that's kind of, a, it gets a bit, quite. it obviously gets quite extreme and it raises questions as to, the militarization of the police, domestic police, 
is actually a good thing or not? We, we get that question a lot about the appropriateness of SWAT teams, and people will usually bring up some kind of uh, heinous event or they'll come up with some supposed hostage situation or a hypothetical that might occur. And certainly you could come up with an example where most people would probably say, you know what, I'd feel comfortable having a SWAT team. Uh, and a lot of times you'd think, OK, places maybe like New York or Miami, places where you would anticipate they would have maybe a higher risk of some kind of event happening. But then you start looking at the data about SWAT teams. And what you find is that by the time we get to the year 2000, I think it's something like 90 percent of towns in the United States with populations of 50,000 or more. So we're not talking big, big towns at all uh, have a SWAT team. There's one particular example. There's a town called Keene, New Hampshire. Uh, so northeastern United States, very, very small town population of, I think, less than 20,000 people. They haven't had a murder since something like 1990. And yet they have a Bearcat, which is a type of armored personnel carrier. One of the things that is often not known about one of the programs through which a lot of these departments get their gear is that there's what's called a use it or lose it provision. So these police departments who receive surplus equipment from the military are required contractually to use these items within a calendar no year. If they don't, they're supposed to return them. So as an economist, you see that and you think, well, the incentives here are not good because mm -hmm. if you offer if you offer police departments high powered and heavy equipment with a caveat that if they don't use it, they have to give it back. You create a scenario where they're going to find reasons to use it. So as opposed to seeing SWAT teams being used for things like hostage situations or other really serious issues, you see police departments sending out the SWAT team for things like people threatening to commit suicide, which oh. is, I, I don't, I do, I do not think that most people would find that uh, appropriate. No, and that's that's their incentive then to actually use the equipment to be called out on a on an event or a situation like that, and they'd be able to use their equipment then for the next calendar year. I think uh, I think there's probably several compounding factors for that, but that's certainly uh, a piece of it. Absolutely. Could somebody argue though that having one of those units in a small town of population of twenty thousand that doesn't that didn't have a, a murder since nineteen ninety is because of the presence of a SWAT team? Or is it just a coincidence that the SWAT team is there and you don't have that particular murder rate? So anytime that you ask questions of causality, you're, you're asking things of your data that you realistically can't do. Um, one of the tricky things about having these conversations is that we don't have uh, the historical counterfactual. So since mm. we don't have a world where these small towns haven't gotten SWAT teams, at least in the United States, we don't have them. We don't have the ability to look and, and see, well, this would have happened had the SWAT teams not been there. Yeah. I think that the more important question is for us to maybe not try to play, play the game of, well, is would this have happened had the SWAT teams not been there? As economists, we, we focus on this idea of, of what is. And so given the fact that this is the current reality, that we have this continued blurring of the military and police in the United States, you have these serious and well-founded concerns about the types of equipment and tactics that police are using. Given that that is the current scenario or the current world in which we live, what does that tell us? What in terms of policy does that? All I can see is that the government is getting larger and that's a worrying situation giving, uh, it's affecting perhaps people's liberties and a large government could be is, is seen historically. If you look at small government compared to large government, small government, such as say the Scandinavian countries seem to pre seem to perform better socially and economically as well as politically. <laughs> 
Yeah, so we address this issue of government growth, but we, we do it in a, in a unique way for economists. So one other thing that economists tend to do when they look at the growth of government is they tend to focus on one area. So they look at scale or the overall size of government. This is in contrast to looking at issues of government scope or the portfolio of activities that government's doing, what kinds of activities that government is doing. And we say that there are a few reasons that economists tend to do that. The first is that it's much easier to quantify changes in scale. So you can look at things like government budget as a percentage of GDP, the number of people who are employed by the government, so on and so forth. You can get some kind of measurement that way. Scope, on the other hand, is not really conducive to those statistical tools that economists are usually most comfortable using. And so one of the things that we are attempting to do in this work uh, and in our other work is to use the tools of economics, maybe not the ones that uh, a lot of economists are used to, to using or working with on a regular basis, but to explore these expansions in scope of government in addition to scale. To your question about governments smaller governments performing better or worse, um, that's definitely an, an empirical question. So you can certainly think about an example or a scenario where you have a small government, so small in scale, but the scope is massive. So you have a very strong dictator. You can also think about a scenario where you have a very large government, so large in scale, but they're very restricted in the scope of their activities. And so mm. as far as that is, you know, as far as that concerned, it's, it's an empirical question. Um, and we, we do address that particular piece in, in the book. Here in Ireland, we have the, what are known as the Garda Síochána, it's the Irish Police Force. And it, they're more known as, I suppose, peacekeepers because they don't carry guns. The only weapon they would have is probably a baton. Um, so I think maybe about 10 or 11 years ago, we created our own equivalent of a SWAT team called an, the Emergency Response Unit. And what they are are more of a, they're a police force, an armed police force that actually train and share facilities and equipment with our own military. And the reason why they were first established was because of uh, gangland crimes, but it, they've also gone into counter-terrorism exercises and so on. And they also, they're the first responders to any incidents where there's a use of a firearm. So that kind of goes against our own, if you want to call it a constitution, whereby we have a, a, a peacekeeping police force. It, it, that's, that does, I think, make sense. But in, in so far as they don't carry a weapon, but now we've gone on to a specialized unit like the SWAT team, where we have perhaps become more military in terms of um, that type of unit, which perhaps is is in, there's more likely a need for it because there, you don't want to send an unarmed police officer to a situation where there's uh, armed conflict or a possibility of an armed conflict and that person is at a disadvantage and you might as well send in uh, something like this. But we haven't, I'm not sure anyway, whether we have undergone uh, a militarization to a level that the United States would be, but it could be the beginning of something. And is that something we should, in a way, be cautious of or be aware of? So one of the things that we're, we're really hoping will happen uh, as a result of this book is that we were particularly interested in people from other backgrounds, particularly people in other countries, utilizing this framework that we've constructed to analyze things that have happened in their own countries. So one of the things that's particularly challenging about this type of research, and I mentioned this a few moments ago with uh, respect to the kind of tools that economists are used to using, uh, a lot of people, if they picked up an economics paper, it looks more like math uh, <laughs> because a lot of it is. It's a very much a statistically driven field at this point in time. But we don't utilize those econometric anal like analytical tools in, in this book or in a lot of this research because it's simply not conducive to it. So mm -hmm. what we look at or what we utilize are what are called analytical narratives. 
So you have a framework that is pinned and supported by theory. And then you develop detailed historical case studies in an effort to illustrate or illuminate that analysis or that framework that you have put uh, before your reader. And one of the challenging pieces of that, uh, in addition to working through the the framework, um, is also having enough historical background to really be able to kind of piece things, things together. One thing that we found when doing the book was actually that the U.S. occupation of the Philippines factors prominently into three of the four case studies that we analyzed. This was not something that we knew or we had anticipated going in. So we, what we found was that our own historical knowledge really needed to be uh, expanded and supplemented, and, and it required a lot of, of research, of digging around, looking at archival pieces, reading up on historians uh, and their particular fields of expertise or their their subject areas. And one thing that is particularly challenging, and when we presented this uh, to foreign audiences, uh, people will have questions or they'll have things in mind that they think look like what it is that we're talking about. But given our own backgrounds as economists, and, and both of us are U.S. citizens, we, we really lack the historical knowledge to be able to dig into some of these things the way that we would like to in an international context. So I'm hoping that people who are interested in maybe the particular topics that we discuss, or this concern regarding the growth and the scale of scope and government in general, that they'll really take on these kinds of projects and be able to use what we have done to show these, to, to show examples or to find these cases in countries where they have some local and, and specific knowledge. Abby, have you ever visited or spoke to any prior or current prison inmates and have them share their stories of the interrogation tactics or the abuse that they might undergo under police custody or within the the jail that actually re- tends to reflect the military occupations or the military tactics of U.S. soldiers abroad? So prior to this research, um, I had the opportunity to tour a jail. But again, that was that was even before I had started in on, on this research. And so uh, there was no there weren't any interviews involved. So the short the short answer to that question in terms of firsthand interviews, it would be no. One of the things that's been remarkably helpful for us, particularly as it comes to looking at things like torture in U.S. prisons, uh, has come from things like co- congressional testimony, journalists. Uh, and also we look at things like w- w- one of the examples that we use is looking at uh, police abuses in Chicago. And so what we have there is substantial amount of documentation in the form of interviews with both attorneys and with police that have been publicly released. If for people who are interested in understanding or who who want some data from those uh, from from prisons, David Scarbeck, who's now at Brown University, uh, he's an economist, but he's in the political science department, uh, wrote a really good book looking at the economics of prison gangs in the United States. Yeah, I had David on the, the podcast previously and I put the link to his episode on the show notes page on your own uh, web, web page when I put it up, Abby. But it was a great interview and a very interesting um, look at uh, a take on this, the prison gangs, all right? Yeah, it would be the, – the idea of doing interviews for this would be something I think that would be particularly – interesting. Um, anytime that you start doing field research, you run into other types. Of, there, there are costs and benefits to doing that type of, of research as well. It's not something that we've particularly looked into uh, at this point. But again, I think that it provides another potential avenue for research that as, as of yet, we, we've, not, we've not really looked into. And I suppose there's potential biases as well in terms of, you know, it, it'd be perhaps best to look at congressional hearings whereby you'd actually see both sides or come to maybe more of a legal conclusion in terms of what actually has happened. Not that you don't want to doubt the person who's giving you the information, 
but I, I suppose sometimes, unless you're a journalist, you have to tread carefully with the information that you actually receive, seek and receive. Any any time that you're looking at information. Um, and, and regardless of whether you're looking at testimony or if you're looking at a data set, you have to be you have to be aware of the fact that there's the potential for error. Maybe people are misremembering, people are lying, maybe your data is wrong. So one of the ways that we attempt to mitigate some of those concerns is really doing our due diligence in terms of cross-referencing different pieces of information and trying to find as many independent data sources as possible. When looking at drone strikes, for example, having accurate data on that margin, and by accurate, I mean knowing for certain that it is absolutely true data, it is impossible. There is no publicly available data which we know is accurately counting U.S. drone strikes abroad. So what do we do? One option is to just not talk about it, which we don't think is appropriate. So we do the best that we can, given the data restrictions that we have. So we look at independent uh, organizations which are trying to keep track of this data. We look at accounts from uh, individuals or organizations in the Middle East, which are keeping track of this. We also compare that and we look at data that's being released by the U.S. government. And when we present the data, we present it with the caveat that there is limitation to the data that we have. But that being said, again, I think that the the import or that the subject is important enough and these topics are important enough that we would be doing ourselves and the potential consequences that we might see as a result of this, we'd be doing that a, a disservice to simply throw up our hands and say, well, since we don't have a, you know, a perfect clean data set, we're not going to do this. Abby, you've even uh, branched out into the militarization of disaster relief, which is a, a working paper that you're co-authoring. And I, I find it hard to get my head around this, the militarization of disaster relief. Is it gone into that type of area too? Or is so, that just to protect an area that, yep. So the paper that, that you're referencing is with my co-author and a colleague of mine at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University named Stephanie Hathaly. And Stephanie has some experience working with FEMA, so it's the Federal Emergency Relief Agency uh, in the United States, and also with the U.S. Forest Service. And so in our discussions with each other, she's looking uh, at it from the perspective of having worked in these organizations and seeing how they respond to uh, disaster relief. And I'm looking at it from this prospect of how have different organizations evolved and changed over time to look like the military. So we're still relatively early in that process of looking at of seeing how that paper is going to unfold and exactly uh, what it's going to look like. But from the preliminary research that we've done so far, what we are seeing is that very much like the police have incorporated military equipment and tactics into their responses. Uh, we're seeing some similar things in disaster relief response. Now, that may not look as a, as intense or as extreme as what we've seen with U.S. police, uh, but we're definitely looking into those connections to see exactly how these organizations have changed and evolved over time. So is it more to do with, say, logistics and how to get to a particular uh, disaster spot at the most efficient time, or is it to do with more the tyranny, as the title of your book goes? So we look at the intention, and again, at this point, it's it's still very early in the in the process. Um, but looking at terms of both how the organizations are are structured, how they operate, uh, and also what happens after a natural disaster. So what is happening in those communities? How are things like you know curfews structured? Mm -hmm. How are citizens treated when? the U.S. government responds to a natural disaster. And one of the things that Chris and I talk about, so to bring it back to the, the question about tyranny in, in the title of the book, one of the things that we utilize, and you mentioned this several minutes ago, was that Mark Twain quote. Mark Twain, the quote that we referenced specifically, he's talking about 
this hypothetical great republic who, by engaging in foreign intervention abroad, winds up inflicting these tyrannical policies on individuals domestically who had at one point applauded the use of these tactics abroad. And so I think what we're hoping will happen as a result of this book is that people will begin to see and to understand that the policies which are being utilized abroad, which people may or may not support, but regardless of whether or not they they support it, people tend to be less upset about things which are occurring far away from home. And so what we're pointing out here is that even if you are just concerned about your own country, so in our case, the United States, even if you are exclusively focused on the United States, you have a very big reason to pay attention to what is going on in foreign policy, because those things which are being developed as tools of war and tools of intervention abroad can and do come to be used at home. That's a pretty much a, a stark reminder of, for anybody, it's pretty ominous, really. Absolutely. Some people might argue that in favor of it because it gives a signaling effect that you want to behave or you could get this particular treatment. But that's not good enough for people who are innocent either. I mean, I think most people, when presented with the idea of their liberties being eroded or being taken away, I, I think and I, I hope that they appreciate the the gravity of, of that kind of, of change. And for Americans specifically, but certainly people in other countries as well, realize that the freedoms that we enjoy are are paramount. They they're essential in, in protecting. One of the things that uh, I've talked about elsewhere, and my, my co-author has as well, is that, again, this, this supposed idea between this trade-off between liberty and security. And when you start to really scratch, when you get below the surface, you start to see a lot of problems with this supposed idea that by giving away our liberties, we're actually getting anything in return. One of the things that uh, I've pointed out in my research on drones uh, is that the supposed technology, which might be, or which is portrayed as keeping us safer and dismantling terrorist organizations, they actually do the exact opposite. So as opposed to disrupting and dismantling terrorist organizations, uh, and Chris and I actually have a recent paper uh, on this as well, is you actually wind up perpetuating terror and you may actually generate a very powerful recruiting tool for terrorist organizations. And so I think that these are things that people really need to, to think about and, and to be aware of. And if we are really interested in talking about these types of problems or solving these issues, then we've got to get our, we, we've got to, we, we've got to look at the facts. I have a couple of questions uh, from listeners, if you don't mind me putting them to you. Absolutely. And I think it's a it's a good continuation from or just what where we left off just now. Um, David Zetland, he's actually been on the podcast himself a few times, but he's asked a couple of questions, and the second one here um, fits perfect. Will militarization make the U.S. a better place to live if you compare the experiences of the troubles and other guns will fix this interventions into civilian life? So the short answer to that question is I think absolutely not. <laughs> I think we've seen. <laughs> I guess that was the answer. <laughs> I think I think we've seen what happens as we've continued to militarize, and just over the last few weeks. My people have contacted my co-author and I because we've had yet another police shooting where police have shot and killed an unarmed civilian in the United States. And I, I don't think the problem is going away. And I think, if anything, you're likely to continue to see this blurring between police and military. And when you have two groups with historically very distinct functions, so as you, you talked about Ireland a moment or a few minutes ago, and police being peacekeepers. That's the original intent 
of the U.S. domestic police forces. They're peacekeepers. They're supposed to uphold the law and protect the rights of citizens, both those people who are offenders and those people who are victims. The military, on the other hand, is intended to seek out and destroy external threats to the United States. When you start to see those two groups come together and you see police referring to their neighborhoods as things like battlefields, Mm -hmm. then I think you have a real problem. You don't want your domestic police force to be treating civilians as though they are enemy combatants. And so I don't see how that goes any which way, but really wrong. (laughs) I only saw a recent police shooting there yesterday on the news and this, I think, guy in his 50s, I think he had just mental health problems. And he, I think he had a screwdriver in his hand and he was surrounded by police with tasers. And the tasers, they went to fire them, but they wouldn't work. And the the guy made a run at one of the police officers and he received something like six to eight bullets. Um, That was it, you know. And it was, to me, looking at it from where I am, it seems like a, an overreaction. Where was... Where was a counsellor? Where was somebody else who could negotiate with this person or talk to this person rather than being surrounded with, by about six to eight police officers with tasers and and guns and to actually make a conclusion like that? You know, surely this could have been done in any other way. And, and certainly any time that you get into discussions about police response, I, t- I tend to not try to get into specifics of particular cases just because I, I'm, I'm not a trained law enforcement officer. Hmm. And I certainly know that there are facts that I am not privy to. But I think what you pointed out is, is what a lot of people see is if you see someone who is surrounded by police officers with weapons and he's armed with a screwdriver, what legitimate threat is this person potentially proposing? Or when you see that someone has been shot by police officers 20 times and eight of those bullets are in the person's back, Mm. how do you justify that use of force? Now, I have every confidence that there are people who would offer answers as to why that is justified. I think a lot of individuals, uh, myself included, have questions And I think that the burden of proof is really on individuals who support that kind of force to illustrate that it is preferable to the alternatives. Abby, the arms industry is quite large in America, both domestically and as an exporting uh, business. And we know there's a large lobby group, the NRA, that tends to influence perhaps political decisions, I don't know, or laws. But your second amendment, again, this goes in with David Zetland's other question. He wants to ask about whether the second amendment, does it make militarization more or less likely? And is there a Baptists and bootleggers coalition in favor of more guns everywhere, which seems to be a contradiction in terms of the, the, the coalition there, baptism or Baptists and bootleggers, which I think that is, is a term or an expression by Bruce Yandel. You're absolutely correct uh, that Bruce Yandel is the is the origin of the bootleggers and Baptist quote there. Um, I haven't really given any thought, to be perfectly honest with you, to the question of Second Amendment and whether that makes police militarization more likely or less likely. It's something that I, I would have to, to think about. My first well, actually, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd really have to have to think about that. Um, in terms of the special interest group point, I think that that's absolutely something to talk about. Although I don't know if I would place the I don't I don't know if I would place the credit for this one on the NRA or the National Rifle Association. They tend to focus on civilian rights to possess firearms in the United States. Talking about the armament industry, though is something that, again, I've done in my co-author and I have done together. um, And my co-author has looked at issues related to the military industrial complex. So Chris Coyne and one of his other co-authors, Tom Duncan, have looked at the military industrial complex in the United States in substantial detail. And if you start looking at that in terms of lobbying. So you look at organization, organizations like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, General Atomics. Those are really powerful interest groups in the United States. They have a really big stake in U.S. foreign policy and kind of uh, 
continuing on with with business as usual and expanding that business. So we've we've looked at that. Uh, I've looked at it in particular within the context of of drones, and certainly other people have looked at it related to other types of military equipment. And so I think there certainly is a, a bootleggers and, and Baptist story there, without question. I have another question by Nicholas Janusz, again a listener, and I got my. Uh... I asked you earlier on, did you ever visit a prison? And I suppose this kind of comes from the question that he's posed. He wants to know, have I ever participated in a police ride along? Uh, I have not. It would be something I'd I'd be interested in doing. Uh, I feel like my husband might freak out (laughs) a little bit if I told him that that was on my my list of things to do. Um, It would be the Walter White of economics i don't i don't think i would have it in me to go like full walter white (laughs) (laughs) no i don't uh, think so (laughs) but at least at least doing doing right along i'm i'm certainly interested in talking to and reading more from members of law enforcement and members of former and current members of the military um i have a much more a direct connection to members of the U.S. Armed Forces. I mentioned my husband a second ago. He's actually a former Marine. Uh, I have other family members who have been part of the U.S. Armed Forces, again, other people in, in the Marine Corps, in the Navy, and in the U.S. Air Force. And I, I have students who are, who are current military, and they've been remarkably helpful in terms of helping to put things in perspective or to explain things which might be uh, a bit foreign to a civilian who is studying this particular topic. Uh, In terms of talking with police officers, uh, a lot of what I've read has been in terms of things uh, like biographies. I do, when engaging in this type of research, look at police journals, read articles from policing magazines. Uh, And so I try to be as informed as possible. And I recognize that these issues are complex. And when you start looking at things from the perspective of a police officer or somebody else in law enforcement, they're certainly bringing a different kind of perspective. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't want people to think, and I, I tell my students whenever we discuss something like policing, I don't think that you have police officers uh, as a collective group who are just really interested in you know, playing soldier and, and hurting people. I, I don't think that that is the the motivation for the vast majority of civilian police forces. Another way of saying it and is that it's not it's not so much the players in the game. It's the game that they're playing and they're they're set up. The incentives that they face are such that their activities tend to get channeled toward option A versus option B. But in the event that I had the opportunity to work more closely or speak with law enforcement, that would be something that I would absolutely, um, I'd be thrilled at the opportunity. I think it would be a fantastic paper to write about, or even if there was, I don't know, I know it's probably a bit extreme to say this, but even kind of a, a TV program to see you given your experience and the perspective that you've actually come up with from reading journal uh, journal entries from other police officers and also the work that you do and c- approach it from and that type of perspective and that you can almost enter it in a somewhat unbiased way and when- draw conclusions based on what you actually see. I know there's what they have is uh, body cams now this police police officers in the US where they can record what they actually um, see in front of them. You know, one of the one of the things that I I try I try to do is I I approach every paper that I write or every question that people ask me for better or worse I approach it as an economist. So I look at things in terms of what incentives do people face? What are the institutional structures in which they're operating? What cost and benefits do these people face at an individual level? And then take it, take it from there. So when looking at these issues, obviously you have people who are coming from different perspectives. And so I recognize that when I read things like policing journals, I'm getting a different perspective. Just like if I am reading uh, something from a prison inmate, I recognize that that's going to give me a different perspective. And I think that some of the best 
analyses or some of the best conversations or something that's particularly productive in moving these conversations forward is when you have people who are genuinely interested in having a productive conversation from different perspectives who are able to bring those different pieces of knowledge together to discuss really complex issues. What type of questions would you think you'd ask the officers if you did go on a ride along or, you know, what in terms of economic questions? Would it be mainly based on the incentives aspects to things or? I think a lot of it would be probably based upon incentives. So in terms of, but also understanding how it is that they perceive the job that, that they do. And I think there's, there's a lot to be done and, and certainly the economics of policing, I'm, I'm not the only one who has looked into this or, or the person said economics, ec- economically speaking, I'm not the only one. And certainly there are many, many other people who have looked at and are interested in uh, tackling issues related to policing. I think a lot of it would probably be related to incentives and then uh, also in terms of institutional structure. So what what constraints do they face as individual officers? What constraints does their department face? Where are those constraints coming from? And I think that getting a better idea of those, not just from an outsider perspective, but also from the people who are operating within those organizations um, can make for a more fruitful and a more robust picture of what's currently going on. Abby, do people pick you up wrong, you know, in terms of the writings that you do, given certain interest groups, or do generally people understand that this is the work of an economist? Um, it, it kind of depends. So anytime that you write something, m- most of the academic literature, so the, the journal articles that I write tend to be mostly reviewed by academics. And so typically, if they're reviewed by academics, then mostly they they they, they know <laughs> they know what's happening. Um, I also happen to do a lot of media and popular press. So I write quite a few newspaper articles. I do interviews both on you know radio, podcast, and and television when the opportunities present themselves. I'm happy to give interviews to journalists. And in terms of how people interpret them, it really it really depends. I try when answering questions and when discussing this topic to make it as clear as I can that I'm coming from this from the perspective of an economist. Now, people may not like what the economic way of thinking has to say or suggests about a particular issue, but I find that a lot of the times I'm actually pleasantly surprised. So we've been talking about former members of the military and former police. And I have received uh, various contacts from current and previous members of law enforcement, current and prior members of the U.S. Armed Forces in particular. And I've always been very surprised. And, And sometimes they certainly are critical, but I'd say actually more often they are incredibly supportive and they say things like you're talking about this and I experienced it firsthand. So they see it as someone who is from an outside perspective, but utilizing tools that gets at this very real experience that they've had. Abby, is it okay to ask you a couple of short questions before we wrap up? Sure. Your book, Tyranny Comes Home, The Domestic Fate of the U.S. Militarism, I'd highly recommend it as a purchase. But do you have any other book that you might like to recommend to our listeners that ha- that you've recently read or that comes to your mind as a very important book in terms of uh, your understanding of economics or an- anything else, anything else at all? Mm. There are so many good books. <laughs> there, there are so many good books that I have that I've read. I think in terms of looking at foreign intervention and some of the failures of foreign intervention, I really like the book We Met Well by Peter Van Buren. Um, So he's someone who uh, was involved on the government side uh, of foreign intervention. And I think his perspective is very powerful. And I I appreciate that that book a whole lot. Um, When I read it, I really enjoyed it and it's definitely helped to, it's been very encouraging 
uh, in my own research. And uh, for people who are interested in just getting into the economic way of thinking, the book that I always recommend is Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. If you're interested in just a, a, a very clear primer on how economists think and what they what they're doing it's a great book fantastic we've had that recommended before and i do highly recommend it as a good read abigail uh, if you could step into the delorean and time travel what era would you like to go back to and who would you like to meet oh i don't know in terms of backwards time travel i really <laughs> enjoy things like indoor plumbing and vaccines so i guess it depends yeah. <laughs> on how on how long i have to stay in terms of people that I would really like to talk to, there are certainly, I guess, my my economic idols that I would love to talk to. So I would like the opportunity to meet Ludwig von Mises. I would like the opportunity to meet and talk with F.A. Hayek. And I also think that Adam Smith would be fascinating to talk to. Um, I'm always blown away every time I have the opportunity to pick up the wealth of nations, for example, of how many just amazing insights that Smith had in, in that book. Um, so I guess for lack of a better, for, for lack of a better clear answer, it's a multi, it, it, it would be, there, there are multiple variables <laughs> that I would consider. I'm sure you'd love to ask uh, Adam Smith, given your work on the Empire Strikes Back, whether U.S. foreign policy would actually be a net benefit compared to John Stuart Mill's conclusion that it'll be, or sorry, whether it'll be a net cost or benefit. Because Adam Smith argued that the British Empire was a net cost, whereas Mill concluded it was a net benefit. And I'm sure you'd love to be able to, perhaps I don't want to be putting words into your mouth, but how their perspective would be on the US, which is hard to conclude because we don't know what the ending point would is likely to be, whereas we know somewhat what way the British Empire went. I feel like that Adam Smith and I would probably actually spend a lot of time agreeing with each other on that point. But <laughs> to to be backed up by Adam Smith, I would feel like would be just a massive feather in my cap. <laughs> so I'd, uh, I'd definitely take it. Abigail, I really appreciate it. I love talking to you and being able to explore your work and reading some of your papers too. First, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on to the show. And I'd like to direct my listeners to your website, abigailorhall.com and the links for all the resources, books, and this website will be mentioned on my podcast, economicrockstar.com forward slash Abigail Hall. Abigail, thank you so much. And you are an economic rock star. Thank you so much for having me. We we appreciate the opportunity to share our work with your listeners. Oh, yeah. One question. I, I leave this out. I don't mind. Um, Josh Hall, you're not a relation to Josh, are you? No, I'm not. Just a coincidence? <laughs> okay. No. Um, although it doesn't stop people from asking. Uh, and there are actually, um, so there's the Josh Hall who teaches at West Virginia University. And then there's another Josh Hall who actually used to teach at the University of Tampa. He's now at Florida Southern University. And so anytime that we're at a conference together and people have no idea who we are, we just confuse everyone. <laughs> Uh, people think we're married, they think we're siblings or cousins. Um, but as far as I know, none, we're, we're not related. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, look, no, that's fine because I've had, um, I know you said you were married to a, a military or an, it was a military man or a yes, Navy yes. man? He's, he's, he's no longer, he's no longer in, uh, in the Marines. He's been out Ex-ma- for Marines. Yeah, he, he's been out for a really long time. Um, the, no, his his last name and, and my legal last name are actually Blanco. So, um, oh, Blanco. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, oh, it's just uh, that we've had a couple of um, partners or husband and wives. I think, I think we've had four of them already on the podcast. Oh, wow. Husband okay. Wife, economist. Imagine what that household will be like. It's, <laughs> well, it is interesting. Two economists. People- when when people hear what I what I research on and then they they find out my husband's background they tend to have similar questions they'll be like God I bet dinners at your house are interesting <laughs> <laughs> but at least it, but, but most of the time though he he usually he usually not not always but he he usually agrees with the the analysis that I that I propose or that I put forward to him about particular things um, and he's he's great in terms of if I'm doing some research that's really in the weeds on U.S. military and I just don't have the institutional knowledge, a lot of times he does. 
Um, and we, we've got other people here at UT who are either currently in the armed forces or are former members of the U.S. Armed Forces, and I've been able to, to utilize them as resources as well. So um, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. It's fantastic. <laughs> Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the Economic Rockstar website. If you enjoy this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.